Following Rome's defeat at Orazio in 105 BC, Marius was still in Africa closing the final details of Numidia's war. The war ended abruptly with the unexpected capture of Numidia's king Jugurtha. Riding high on the popularity of his Numidian success, Marius received word from the Senate that he had been nominated to the office of consul a second time, for the year 104 BC. The Mos Maiorum, that written code of conduct and tradition adhered to by members of the Senate, stated that all consular candidates had to announce their candidacies in person. Additionally, no ex-consul could run for consular re-election until ten years had elapsed. Despite these traditions, Gaius Marius was elected to the consular chair by the unanimous will of the people. They voted him in absentia, and without his even running for the office. With the loss of three armies, and approximately 200,000 Roman lives to the invading Germans, the Roman people trusted no one but Gaius Marius to protect them from the expected invasion. Marius's first order of business was to replenish Rome's depleted troops. Caepio had lost most of his traditional landed citizen army, and Maximus had lost most of his head count army. If he hoped to defeat the Germans, Marius needed more troops. He immediately sent word to Rome's Latin and Italian states requesting their urban poor for conscription into Rome's legions. This proved a difficulty, however, as the Italian urban poor was almost non-existent. Though a portion of the Latin states had acquired Roman citizenship, the Italian states were still struggling to obtain that right. Because the Italian urban poor were not Roman citizens, they did not qualify for social programs like Gaius Gracchus's grain dole. This left the majority little choice but to surrender themselves into debt bondage so as to avoid starvation. Debt bondage was a form of voluntary slavery which allowed people to work off great debts. Unfortunately, with so many Italians enslaved, this left precious few from which Marius could build up new legions. To overcome this problem, Marius legislated a bill to free the Italian debt slaves from bondage. This law was specific to Italian citizens enslaved due to economic hardship, and did not extend to conquered peoples sold into slavery from distant lands. However, this led to a massive problem in Sicily. Gracchus's grain dole forced Rome to buy grain in larger quantities than her own land provided. As a result of letting grain contracts to feed Rome's urban poor, Sicily, with its rich soil and abundant harvests, became Rome's new breadbasket. But, with more than 25% of Sicily's farm labour made up of Italian debt slaves, the freeing of these workers caused a massive grain shortage, and sharply updriven prices. Additionally, those slaves in Sicily who were not included in Marius's legislation were outraged that only Italian slaves were freed. Those slaves began rioting, and before long, Sicily had a full-scale slave rebellion on its hands. Racing across Sicily, these rebelling slaves murdered farm owners and their families, freeing captive slaves along the way. The governor of Sicily, Nerva, sent an armed force of 600 to put down the revolt, but they were easily overrun by the rebellion's increasing numbers. Confident after defeating Nerva's men, the rebels appointed an ex-slave by the name of Salvius to be their king. Salvius, who was likely of eastern descent, renamed himself in honour of the Seleucid ruler, Diodotus Tryphon. Calling himself, King Tryphon, Salvius led his new army of freed slaves to the city of Morganshire. Nerva, again, responded by sending relief to the city and, again, the governor's forces were defeated. Following the sacking of Morganshire, King Tryphon's army grew to approximately 20,000 fighters and 2,000 cavalry. In the west of Sicily, another slave king, named Athenian, rose to power amidst the rioting violence. Athenian marched his slave army across Sicily and combined it with the army of King Tryphon. With the rebel forces now at 40,000, Rome sent the praetor, Lucius Licinius Lucullus to Sicily with a full army. Upon hearing the Roman Senate was sending a proper army, King Tryphon made plans to withstand a long siege by falling back to their new stronghold, the town of Triacala. Athenian, however, convinced Tryphon that daring to meet the Romans on the battlefield would give them the advantage, and guarantee them the win. Unfortunately, when the battle was over, 20,000 rebel slaves lay massacred on the field. Athenian himself fell and feigned death in order to stay alive. But, because his men thought him fallen, they lost heart and attempted to flee. This gave the Romans the upper hand. By nightfall, King Tryphon and the 20,000 soldiers who remained, had gone to earth at Triacala. Athenian, who under cover of darkness, made his discreet escape from the battlefield, joined them. Lucullus soon followed and laid siege to Triacala, but the city could not be easily taken, and the siege stretched on into the 103 BC year. For failing to take Triacala quickly, 
the Senate refused to prolong Lucullus's command in Sicily, and recalled him to Rome. In his place, a new man named Quintus Servilius the Augur was given command of Lucullus's army, so that he could conclude this slave rebellion history now calls the Second Servile War. But Lucullus wasn't about to let some new man come in and take credit at the end of a campaign for all the hard work he had already accomplished. Following the Senate's edict, Lucullus prepared to leave Sicily, but not before commanding his army to burn every piece of siege equipment, and destroy the military camp they had built at Triacala. Lucullus had no intention of being the next Metellus Numidicus, stripped of his laurels so the likes of another Gaius Marius could come in and claim his victory at the eleventh hour. If Servilius the Augur wanted the laurels of victory, deemed Lucullus, then he could earn them for himself, from scratch. As his final act, Lucullus, following the example of Metellus Numidicus, discharged his legions, and then left Sicily for Rome. In Rome, Marius continued working to rebuild Rome's armies. But, because the Germans, after their victory at Orazio, had once again turned north, Rome was in the dark as to where and when they might attack next. Marius then commanded two of his quaestors, Lucius Cornelius Sulla and Quintus Sertorius, to gather intelligence on the Germans. We don't know everything involved in Sulla and Sertorius's spying campaign, but Sertorius, we are told by the historians, grew his hair and beard long, learned the German tongue, and lived among the wandering tribes for approximately two years. Though we know Sulla was part of this effort as well, we are not given the specific details of his involvement. Until he had a better understanding of the Germans' plans from Sulla and Sertorius, Marius, who was elected to the consulship yet again for the 103 BC year, put his army to good use repairing roads and aqueducts along the Alps. But the Senate did not like a man's being consul three times within five years. To them, holding the highest office in the land, year after year, simply because he was popular with the people, was the necessary ingredient for the making of a populist king. Soon, the Senate began spreading the narrative that the German threat was actually over, and that Marius was simply playing on the fears of the people so they would keep him in power. They pointed out that as consul, Marius was doing nothing but building roads and repairing aqueducts, duties which belonged to lower-level magistracies. They criticized him for not remaining within the city to oversee the consul's non-military, civic duties. Then again, the Senate whispered, since it was illegal for Marius to bring his army into the city, and since he was only powerful by the strength of that army, it better served Marius's ambitions to remain in the field. The whispering campaign began to have its intended effect throughout the 103 BC year. Almost two years had passed since Orazio, with no more signs of activity from the Germans. People had begun to go on with their lives. They no longer feared the prospect of attack. As the consular elections for the 102 BC year neared, it looked doubtful that Marius's continuation of the consulship would be necessary. Then Sulla and Sertorius returned from their spying campaign with news of the Germans' movements. The horde had split into three groups, each led by a different king. They planned to take Italy on three different fronts with a timed attack. Finally, something was happening. Despite the Senate's best efforts to make Gaius Marius irrelevant, the panic which erupted with the news of the Germans' plans, saw the Roman people quickly confirm Marius in his fourth consulship for the 102 BC year. Marius, who had kept his legions posted near the Alps, marched them to Aqua Sextii, modern-day Provence. Aqua Sextii was the location the Ambrones and Teutones, under the leadership of King Teutobod, were expected to invade. When the Germans appeared, probably in late spring, they found Marius's veteran legions prepared to face them in open battle. What the Germans did not know was that before forming his ranks, Marius had commanded one of his legates, a man by the name of Manius Aquilius, to take 4,000 cavalry and cross the river far downstream. From there, the cavalry waited until the Germans were fully engaged with Marius's legions, then they charged from the rear. When the Battle of Aqua Sextii was finished, Gaius Marius sent Manius Aquilius riding hard to the Senate with the report that 37,000 Romans had defeated over 100,000 Germans. King Teutobod was killed on the battlefield and 17,000 German warriors were taken alive to be sold on the slave blocks, along with thousands upon thousands of women and children. Rather than be sold into slavery, 300 German women, when they saw the battle was lost, took their own lives, and were consequently celebrated by the Romans for their bravery. Following the Battle of Aqua Sextii, Gaius Marius and Manius Aquilius, the two heroes of the German campaign, were elected to the consulship for the 101 BC year. The consul, Manius Aquilius, took units of Marius's army. Marching for Sicily, Aquilius replaced Servilius the Augur, who had done nothing but flounder against the slave revolt. 
Marius took the remainder of his army and marched to join the army of another general, Catulus. Together, the two armies defeated the Cimbri, who invaded under the leadership of their king, Boiorix. After the Cimbri fell, Marius's and Catulus's legions swept through the area, cleaning up the last bit of Cimbri resistance. The Marcomanni, Cherusci, and Tigrini, after separating from the horde after Orazio, did not breach Rome's borders with the rest of the Germans. Instead, they continued migrating north, settling in various places along the Rhine River. By the time the German threat ended, Gaius Marius had been elected consul five times for the years 107, 104, 103, 102, and 101 BC. Marius, during his successive consulships made many radical changes which improved Rome's military mobility and speed. Besides removing the property qualifications necessary to enlist in the military, Marius made changes that reformed the size of a military cohort. He redesigned the Roman spear, making it more practical, while simultaneously prohibiting the enemy from picking them up and using them. Marius shortened the length of the soldiers' swords, and he introduced the numbered eagle standards to the legions. Marius even reformed the standard military baggage train by forcing his men to carry the majority of their own provisions. This earned his soldiers the nickname, Marius's Mules, by those conservative senators who viewed these changes as nothing more than the creation of professional armies, beholden only to their commanders. In the elation following Rome's victory against the Germans, Marius was, again, unanimously elected to his sixth consulship for the 100 BC year. This election had nothing to do with an impending threat, and was more of a thank you from a grateful people of Rome. In addition to granting Marius this sixth consulship, the people also began referring to him as the third founder of Rome, behind Romulus and Remus.